All right, for 8.9, this is the end of the war. We'll start with the Battle of Berlin. Remember that by the end of summer, 1944, both the Russians, or the Soviets, as well as the British and Americans were equidistant from Berlin. It was a race to see who would get to Berlin, and it is the Russians who make it there first. Um, Hitler was still convinced of German superiority, that German victory was assured. At this point, it is absolutely not going to happen, but he is deluded. Um, I love this photograph here. It is the last known photograph of Hitler awarding medals to soldiers. I'm like, those aren't soldiers, they're children. Yes, the Nazis had sort of um, recruited or drafted, if you will, um, boys to fight the war because there just was no one left. But Hitler is determined to continue fighting. But he was working and living from within a bunker that had been built in Berlin um, below ground level, this massive concrete uh, complex. He had his top commanders down with him, including Joseph Goebbels and his longtime girlfriend named Ava Braun. Um, even though it is abundantly clear that the Russians are in the city, it's just a matter of days, he refuses to surrender. He actually marries Eva Braun, but uh, many people were suggesting that he get out of the bunker, that he get to safety, or maybe that he even surrender, but he refuses to accept this. So this is a clip from the movie Downfall. It is a German film about sort of these last few weeks in Hitler's bunker. Das deutsche Geschütz, die solchen Namen machen? Ich fürchte nein. Aber Steiners Angriff muss ja schon im Rollen sein. Wir müssen bald wie möglich verschwinden. Es bleibt nicht mehr viel Zeit. Aber der Führer ist so zuversichtlich, dass er die Lage meistern kann. Er ist sicher, dass der Angriff von Steiner alles zum Guten wenden wird. Ich habe ihm mehrmals sagen hören, dass dieser Angriff das gesamte Kriegsgeschehen beeinflussen wird. Jeder in der Umgebung des Führers weiß, dass das ein Hirngespinst ist. Fantasie! Ich würde mich wundern, wenn er selbst daran glaubt. Was soll das denn heißen? Warum sollte er denn ein Spiel mit uns spielen? Was hat er denn noch zu verlieren? Ich glaube ihm kein Wort! Es ist dem Feind gelungen, die Front in breiter Formation zu durchbrechen. Im Süden hat der Gegner Zossen genommen und stößt auf Starnsdorf vor. Der Feind operiert jetzt am nördlichen Stadtrand zwischen Frohnau und Pankow. Und im Osten ist der Feind bis zur Linie lichtenberg marsdorf karlshorst gelangt. Mit dem Angriff Steiners wird das alles in Ordnung kommen. Mein Führer, Steiner, Steiner konnte nicht genügend Kräfte für einen Angriff massieren. Der Angriff Steiner ist nicht erfolgt. Es bleiben im Raum. Keitel, Jodel, Krebs und Butter. Das war ein Befehl! Der Angriff Steiners war ein Befehl! Wer sind Sie? Jeder hat mich verlogen, sogar die SS. Die gesamte Generalität ist nicht zweiter als ein Haufen niederträchtiger, treuloser Feiglinge. Mein Führer, ich kann nicht zulassen, dass die Soldaten, die für Sie verbringen... Ist das Feiglinge? Verräter und Versager! Mein Führer, was Sie da sagen, ist ungeheuerlich. Die Generalität ist das Geschmeiß des deutschen Volkes. Sie ist ohne Ehren. 
Sie nennen sich Generale, weil Sie Jahre auf Militärakademien zugebracht haben, nur um zu lernen, wie man Messer und Gabel hält. Jahrelang hat das Militär meine Aktionen nur behindert. Es hat mich gegen Mord und Widerstand in den Weg gelegt. Ich hatte gut daran getan. Von Jahren alle höheren Offiziere registrieren zu lassen, wie Stalin. Ich war nie auf einer Akademie. Und doch habe ich allein, allein auf mich gestellt, ganz Europa erobert. Verräter. Von allem Anfang an bin ich so verraten und betrogen worden. Es wurde ein ungeheurer Verrat geübt am deutschen Volke. Aber alle diese Verräter werden bezahlen. Mit ihrem eigenen Blut werden sie bezahlen. Sie werden das Saufen in ihrem eigenen Blut. Bitte gerne. Jetzt beruhig dich doch. Felsen in den Wind gesprochen. Es ist unmöglich, unter diesen Umständen zu führen. Es ist aus. Der Krieg ist verloren. Aber wenn Sie, meine Herren, glauben, dass ich das mit Berlin verlasse, irren Sie sich gewaltig. Er jag ich mir eine Kugel durch den Kopf. Tun Sie, was Sie wollen. gesagt haben, dass er sich erschießen will. Oh, Frau Junge, Frau Christian. Sehen Sie sich sofort um. In einer Stunde geht ein Flugzeug, das Sie nach Süden bringt. Das ist alles verloren. Hoffnungslos verloren. Aber du weißt doch, dass ich bei dir bleibe. Ich lasse mich nicht wegschicken. Mein Führer, ich bleibe auch. Today, the location of the bunker, um, it has not been maintained in Germany. This is a very interesting, touchy subject. Um, with things relating to Hitler, do you protect it as sort of a memorial or would people have glorified him? So all that remains is just this sign um, you can see in the bottom right hand corner of the Führer bunker. With Hitler out of the way, um, there still is some Nazi leadership left, but the Soviets do take control of the city. And this will be hugely significant for what happens next. But it also means that the war in Europe is over. So then the Nazi generals are left to decide what to do, and they decide to surrender very wisely. So that officially takes place on May 8, 1945. So that is called Victory in Europe, or VE Day. And there was widespread relief, celebrations, um, in particular, in Britain, these communities that have been under the threat of war for nearly six years, extreme rationing, everyone pulls together their supplies and their resources to throw a big party. This is such a relief. But the thing is, the war isn't entirely over yet. There still is the war in the Pacific. Now, if we look at the map, this map is from 1939. So much of what happens in the Pacific starts off as 
leftover tension from the colonial era. We have Australia and New Zealand, which are technically British. Then we have these in yellow territories controlled by Great Britain, including Ireland and India and sort of Thailand. Then there's the Dutch. And look at how much the Japanese have. Remember, we, we talked about the Japanese wanting to extend a sphere of influence to prove that they are the most powerful in their neighborhood. And this is the result of the Meiji era being forced to open to the West. Um, some of the island groups they received after World War I, like the Caroline Marianas and um, Marshall Islands. Um, Japan had done this, uh, taken much of this territory, especially on the mainland of Korea, Manchuria, and China. Um, they'd been very aggressive in doing this. And so this makes everyone else in the neighborhood a little bit nervous. They're nervous about their colonies. Even America has the Philippines. They're nervous about this Japanese aggression. Um, many, many important battles, but since this is a European class, we're just going to very quickly go over some of the, the big ones. We've got the Battle of Midway, which is midway between the U.S. and Japan. Now, because the Pacific Ocean is so vast, it was important to control these islands. So whoever could control Midway would have a refueling station, could have um, an airfield from which to conduct further battles. So the Allies win this, and it's a pretty big turning point. The general tactic that will be used in the Pacific is called island hopping. The Allies want to reclaim this whole corridor of islands from the Japanese. And rather than fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat, um, they decided to use air power to take back, to have sort of these bombing campaigns to force the Japanese to retreat. General Twining rejoined our theater commander, General Millard Harmon, in planning new operations up the Solomon Island chain. We had fresh B-24s, and in July, we were able to launch our 37-day campaign to Jap-held Munda Field on New Georgia Island. Some of us had taken off from hard-won Henderson Field on Guadalcanal, which American men had bought and paid for with their lives. The blow we were about to deliver to Munda, we hoped, would make their sacrifices worthwhile. We were finally nearing the island. As soon as we made our approaches to Munda, Jungle-hopping medium bombers went after the Jap Air Drum and its defenses. Then our liberators opened up. Stubbornly, the enemy held on until 171 aircraft dropped 145 tons of bombs in a half hour. It was the heaviest air bombardment yet cooked up in the South Pacific in one day. By the time resistance had ended, the enemy had lost 350 aircraft. In only nine days, the Allies rushed the strip into operating condition. P-40s were the first to land, followed by heavy bombers which could easily be carried on the coral runways. Warhawks helped protect the base as we rapidly built it into a key for the Solomon Islands. In a few weeks, traffic exceeded that of any field in the South Pacific, reaching the peak of 564 aircraft in one day. The Munda campaign had shown the success of a new tactic bypassing heavily defended enemy points and gaining air superiority behind them. General MacArthur described the island hopping campaign as a series of battles for airfields. In the South Pacific, as elsewhere in all global operations, the Allies had proved the might of air power. Air power had helped clear submarines from the Atlantic. Air power had conquered the hump. Air power had made Pacific island hopping possible. Another reason why um, the Allies didn't necessarily want to fight hand-to-hand -hand was they wanted to limit the number of prisoners of war who were taken by the Japanese. The Japanese uh, treated their prisoners abominably. 
They would send them on forced marches, use them as forced labor, and all of this in this really harsh, hot, humid climate. Uh, here we have a pho famous photograph of an Australian officer about to be beheaded by a samurai sword. And this is part of the reason why the Japanese were such a difficult foe. By this point in the war, by, by spring 1945, the Japanese are the only ones left from their allies. The Germans and the Italians are out of the war, so the Japanese are all that's left. And they refuse to give up. And this really comes from that sort of samurai Bushido tradition that you fight to the last, you fight for your honor. We see this at Iwo Jima. Um, Iwo Jima was a volcanic island and the Japanese had dug series of caves all throughout. They were willing to hold on to that island. It wasn't that they needed to farm or anything, but it was the proximity to Japan that it could be used as an airfield to then launch bombing campaigns over Japan. Again, using that fight to the last mentality. And the Allies just are exhausted. They have risked so many men, so many lives at Iwo Jima. Um, by this point in the war, it was very common for, for journalists to be traveling uh, to send back information of what's going on. And he wanted to capture the American success and victory on, uh, on the island of Iwo Jima. The tallest point was Mount Suribachi. So he, this was the photo he wanted to get. And when he was testing his camera, this was another photo he took. This becomes the famous photo and the inspiration for the Iwo Jima Memorial in Arlington, Virginia. So the Pacific Campaign, the Pacific Theater in general, very, very costly. Um, and the British and Americans have to decide, are they willing to continue fighting this war at, if the costs are going to continue in the same fashion? They decide they aren't, which is why it was so important to use the atomic bomb. This had been developed over a number of years by the Manhattan Project, and um, there were a few tests that were done using this weapon. These were the only instances where nuclear weapons were used as a wartime measure. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we'll be learning more about the atomic bombings in Japan during World War II. In the early days of the Second World War, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the United States government were warned by noted scientific minds Albert Einstein and Leo Szilard of the possibility that Nazi Germany might attempt to develop nuclear weapons. After being urged to undertake their own research, the US, UK and Canada approved the Manhattan Project in late 1941. By 1943, development and research on nuclear bombs by the Manhattan Project began in earnest. Several concepts for these atomic weapons were explored, but finally two were chosen. The first was codenamed Little Boy. This bomb used uranium as its weapon and was propelled using the gun method. The Little Boy was not tested prior to being used as a weapon in World War II. Next came the Fat Man Bomb. Its nuclear explosion was caused by plutonium, and as opposed to the little boy, the fat man's detonation was caused by an implosion. This device was tested prior to its use in warfare. On July 16, 1945, the gadget was successfully tested in the New Mexico desert. This explosion resulted in a bright flash of light and heat, followed by a shock wave and a mushroom cloud that rose 40,000 feet. This event is credited with ushering in the atomic age. The United States and the Allies then had nuclear weapons at their disposal and planned to use them in an effort to end the war. Just a few months prior to the bomb's test, on May 8, the Germans unconditionally surrendered. Because of this, Japan became the next likely target, and several Japanese cities were then proposed. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were finally chosen as the most strategic bombing locations due to their importance in the war effort. On July 26, 1945, representatives of the US, UK, and Chinese nationalist governments issued the Potsdam Declaration to the Japanese. This document ordered the Japanese to immediately surrender or they would face prompt and utter destruction. The Japanese government chose to ignore these extreme demands and made it clear to the Japanese public that the government would not acquiesce. And so, on August 6, 1945, in an effort to quickly resolve the war, the little boy bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan by the Enola Gay bomber at 8.15 a.m. local time. 
The bomb exploded above the city and caused the destruction of roughly five square miles of land. Not only that, but 70,000 people were injured and 70 to 80,000 more were instantly killed. Japan remained steadfast in their refusal to bow to pressure. Three days after the Hiroshima bombing, the country was still attempting relief efforts when the boxcar bomber dropped the Fat Man bomb on Nagasaki at 11.01 a.m. on August 9th. The bomb missed its intended target, but the explosion above Nagasaki killed between 40 and 75,000 people instantly. While burns and radiation poisoning were immediate health problems caused by the bombs, the effects of both explosions were felt for years to come. Cancers and other diseases plagued the population in the decades following the attacks. The American government prepared for the possibility of further nuclear attacks on Japan. However, it was unnecessary. On August 14th or 15th local time, Japan finally surrendered. When the surrender documents were finally signed on September 2, 1945, the war was effectively over. They dropped the first bomb over Hiroshima, and the Americans are hoping, the British are hoping as well, that the, the impact, the size of this bomb would convince the Japanese to surrender. But they don't. Again, that Bushido code. So the Americans dropped the second bomb over Nagasaki. Now you can see here, here's an aerial photograph before the bomb and below is after. It just wipes out this community and it was a calculated risk. The Allies knew that there would be heavy losses.